Hi guys, time for another episode of Idolized History, and this time the votes have been cast for one of my favorite American presidents. A man who not only changed the world by enforcing America's massive navy against the enemies of peace, but also became one of the first men in American history to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Today we walk softly with a big stick and talk about the truly great man Theodore D. Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was born October 28, 1858, into one of the wealthiest families in New York, his father being Theodore Roosevelt Sr. He descends from the original Dutch merchants who made their wealth in New York Harbor in the 17th century. His father was a glassware merchant and part of the gentry of the era. His mother, Martha Bullock, came from the aristocracy of southern Georgia, and together they created a power couple that would find themselves in the highest ranks of New York's Knickerbocker society. In this landscape, Teddy Roosevelt would come to know the type of man he wished to become and the privilege and splendor of high life society. Despite this, Teddy suffered from asthma attacks and poor eyesight that, though impairing, led him to a lifestyle of self-growth and exercise. In order to improve his asthma, he boxed and lifted weights in a room converted into his own personal gym. As another form of relief from his asthma attacks, Teddy would spend a lot of his time in the New York countryside, becoming enthralled with natural sciences. Nature to this future grade of American history was like life, fresh air, and an ease of relaxation. This would follow him throughout his life as a naturalist, believing even before his time in politics that he would become a natural scientist. He would document birds, plant life, and other fauna during this period, something that would follow him his entire life. When he turned 18 in 1876, Teddy enrolled at Harvard, advancing heavily in his studies and in the field of sports. As a competitive man, Teddy took to both as a means of pride and would graduate with high levels of distinction four years later. During this time, he would get married to Alice Lee. Soon after, he'd spend a year studying in Germany before returning to New York to serve in politics as an assemblyman. During his opening years in politics in 1884, Teddy received harsh news and a double barrel blast of grief as his wife would die in childbirth and two days later his mother of typhoid fever. The events would trouble him for the rest of his life as he battled a mental struggle with feeling like he was to blame for his wife's passing. Regardless, he would soon remarry as his longtime friend and future first lady, Edith K. Caro, came into his life. He lived throughout his second marriage, believing it to be a stain on his honor as a man, being quoted as saying, I have always considered that they have argued weakness in man's character. You could not reproach me one half as bitterly as I reproach myself, showcasing his struggles with Alice's passing. Despite this guilt, Teddy would fuel it into a long-term commitment to do better in the name of Alice's memory, showcasing his iron will and disposition even as his personal tragedies lingered. Teddy would be elected initially in 1881 at the ripe age of 23, making him the youngest member of the Assembly in New York history. Serving three terms up until 1884, he would become the minority leader in 1883. During these years, he would most notably create the first civil service legislation and outlaw making cigars in tenement buildings. The latter law was deemed unconstitutional, and he even attempted to pass legislation against men who beat their wives, though this was tragically shot down. Despite the death of his wife and mother, which saw him moving back to North Dakota to live on a ranch, 1886 saw Theodore Roosevelt on top of his political game, making the most of his time as an assemblyman. He was seen as a crusader against corruption as he would enter his position swinging against local corporate corruption. Early on, he would block such nonsense as public financiers attempting to lower taxes on themselves, as well as would begin his time doing what perhaps he is known for best, trust busting. During this time, Edith and Teddy would become married, and after his third run for mayor, he would settle down at Sagamore Hill in Oyster Bay. While Edith took care of their five children from 1887 to 1888, Theodore Roosevelt spent his time writing four books of significant value. These books were a four-part collection known as The History of the Frontier, Winning the West. These books would go on to act as a form of chronological retelling of the American Western expansion and the wars against the native tribes as well as the British, Spanish, and French against the Americans at the time. Between 1889 and 1895, Theodore served as a U.S. Civil Service Commissioner in Washington, D.C. After this, from 1895 to 1897, he became the president of the police commissioners, which saw him make huge changes to the physical and educational standards of police officers at the time. 
Teddy sought to modernize America's police force and makes it more professional in order to keep it up with the growing corruption from organized crime. His efforts would see a new standardization of the police, granting them better communication, transportation, education, and weapon technology to help them protect the general public. In 1897, Teddy Roosevelt found himself preparing for war as he saw Spain readying themselves for a war over Cuban independence. Finally, when in 1898 Spain declared war against the United States, he resigned from his post and enlisted as a lieutenant colonel in the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, also known as the Rough Riders. On July 1st, his regiment would become the heroes of the battle for Kettle Hill and San Juan Heights. After this, his unit would be mustered out in September, and by then he would be nominated for governor of New York by the Republican Party. Ironically, it would be the same corrupt political party that would be in his iron sights only a few years later. Despite this, the head of the Republican state machine, Senator Thomas C. Platt, mistrusted Roosevelt as a reformer, but accepted his olive branch of cooperation. So, that year, Roosevelt would win, barely defeating the Democratic candidate Augustus Van Wyck. So, as both a war hero and an elected governor, Teddy would find himself as both the dashing crusader of fairness and the man with the largest stick to wave around. Despite this, as a governor, Teddy would be forced to work as another cog in the political machine. Knowing if not for the Republican Party leader Platt, he would get nothing passed with legislation. Despite his views being partisan as well as practical, Teddy believed that the needs of the people outshine the needs of the political parties. That being said, he would frequently convene in conference with Platt in order to make sure that his reforms could at least have a chance of passing. Despite this game of mental checkers between two opposing forces, Teddy found himself frequently on top, though couldn't win every time. Because of this, he would become quite the popular voice, ratifying such legislation as improving civil service systems, raising teacher salaries, and setting wage and hourly standards for state employees and government contractors. He also passed several very important laws, such as the outlawing of segregation in public schools and putting a franchise tax on companies controlling public utilities. Not only did Teddy make several laws pertaining to the needs of the people, but also in the name of his love for nature. To this, he would be instrumental in the expansion of the New York Forest Preserves and reform the Fish and Game Service. Additionally, he established the Palisades Interstate park and outlawed bird plumage in the making of women's apparel. These impacts can still be seen today as he became one of the biggest supporters of national parks even once he was elected as president. Before he would become president, Teddy Roosevelt would serve as vice president to William McKinley. Unfortunately, after William was assassinated in Buffalo, Roosevelt took office on September 14, 1901. As the youngest president in United States history, at 42 years old, he would begin a series of events that would, for the next eight years, see our nation grow into one of the largest powers in the world. During his time as president, Teddy would champion his idea of the square deal. This saw him breaking up trusts and regulating big businesses as he got into the ring with some of the richest men in America. He also began some of the first federal irrigation projects known as the New Lands Reclamation Act of 1902 and protected consumers through inspections of meat and quality, taking the form of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Further, he created some of the first workers' compensation, holding companies liable for the injuries of workers on site known as the Federal Employers' Liability Act of 1908. Further, Teddy Roosevelt would show his love for nature once more by reserving over 230 million acres of parks, forests, and national monuments. By doing so, he would preserve much of America's natural beauty, which he held such a strong connection with during his time as a youth. In many ways, it was due to his time as an asthmatic youth who was forced into the country air that brought him to these decisions, and with one of his best friends, Jonathan Meir, he would champion the naturalist goal of protecting America's wildlife. Abroad, Roosevelt had the goal of maintaining a strong American presence overseas, using the term walking softly with a big stick to describe America's role in the world. By maintaining a powerful navy and by enforcing his Monroe Doctrine of 1904, he would begin the age-old picture of America's serving as the policeman of the Latin world. This would play into his actions in Colombian Panama as he connected the two with the Panama Canal. This canal would finish in 1906 and acted as one of the highlights of his career as it opened up vital shipping lanes from America to Europe and Africa. 
During his time as president, he would mediate the end of the Russo-Japanese War, and for this he gained a Nobel Peace Prize in 1906, being both one of the youngest recipients and one of the first Americans to receive it in the same breath. During this time, he would marry his niece to the future president of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Finally, Teddy announced in 1908 that he would not run for a third term after winning the presidency in 1904. He would leave office formally on March 4, 1909 as one of the most accomplished presidents in modern history. After his presidency ended in 1909, Theodore Roosevelt enjoyed his time by leading an expedition throughout Africa on behalf of the Smithsonian Institute. Following this, he toured Europe in 1910 until returning home to find his original political party, the Republicans, split in two. He would spend three years trying to glue the progressive and conservative Republicans back together up until the advent of World War I. During World War I, Roosevelt would be highly vocal to his disdain for Wilson's neutrality politics, seeing America as the policeman who could bring the world back to heel from the chaos of the war. Refusing a second run for governor in 1918, he was voted as the favorite of the Republican Party in 1920. Despite this, he would spend the rest of his life as a family man and writer, choosing to influence Americans through speech and public events where he not only showed his support for political candidates but also for the arts and sciences. In 1920, Teddy's life and blood, the Bull Moose Party, would formally fall apart, followed closely by his death. Throughout America, you will find a large number of statues, national parks, and nature reserves that hold Theodore Roosevelt's name on them, both a sign of his life's work and as well as his passion and death. He inspired millions not only to stand up for what they thought was right, but also to plant the seeds for what will grow for future generations. And while he may have been controversial for his Panama Canal and his expensive military Monroe Doctrine, there's little doubt of how important he was to our nation and to the world. While Teddy's life was one of war, nature, and the struggle to keep his colleagues together, it's universally seen how instrumental he was during the late 1800s to 1920s. He would see America go from the Wild West era, through the Great War, and into the Great Depression. He left behind millions of acres of preserved lands, allowing not only humanity but nature itself to thrive under his kind hand. He spent his life attempting to be more than a simple asthmatic boy from the upper echelons of New York's Knickerbocker community. Teddy was a man who, while grander than life, inspired each and every one of us to be grander than ourselves. We see his name throughout the infrastructure that still stands, dug by his own two hands. Things like the Food and Drug Administration, the corporate regulations, and fair workers' rights that we enjoy today. We see it in our political freedoms and our ability to follow the pursuit of happiness unchained by a company thumb. He was a loving husband, a caring father, and one of the greatest of American presidents. And no matter where in history we choose to look at him, beneath the surface of that grand armor comes the pride of a red-blooded American. Bully to you, Mr. President.